It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. Who wants to talk sports on a Monday? We do. From the Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center Studios in San Diego, we welcome you to our Monday bonus podcast, Hacksaw's Headlines. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, along with my co-host, the baseball junkie, (laughs) John Riley. We welcome you coming off a great sports weekend, pilot into the beginning of the baseball playoffs. This podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers, nine stores to serve you in San Diego. If you've got projects, they've got materials. If you need ideas, they can be your consultant and your best friend. Think Dixie Line Lumber. John Riley, we got baseball pennant races to talk about. We got NFL football to talk about, college football, and then today's quote, Play in games. What a wild 72 hours we've had in sports. Yeah, I mean, we had to peel ourselves away from the TV <laughs> to get started. The eighth inning and the top of the ninth were wild. We're going to go a lot of different directions, so I ask you to bear with us a couple of business items before we start. When we're done with this podcast, we open it up to you, you, the viewer, on live stream. You get the chance to participate, asking a question, making a statement. It's what we call Fans Forum. John, explain it. Okay, Fans Forum. You have a comment or question for Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Now's your chance. Drop your take in the live chat on Facebook, X, or YouTube. We'll get you involved in Fans Forum right after Hacksaw's headlines. And a couple of other items. I know you're all on social media. I'd like you to join my Twitter all-star team. Just use my handle. Go to Hacksaw1090. Hit the follow button because I put a lot of stuff up on Twitter during the course of the day. Want you to share, want you to subscribe, tell everybody what we're doing with this podcast, Mondays and Thursdays. If you feel free, give us a thumbs up. We'd really like to have a five-star rating. It helps us a great deal. Also, when you go to my website, LeeHacksawHamilton.com, I write sports every day of the week. When we're done with this podcast this afternoon, just punch it up. Take a look at all the written material I have. I think you'll really like it. And it's always there. Every morning, we add new stuff to my website, LeeHacksawHamilton.com. Also, there's an orange box. Fill out your information there on the email. You'll get on our mailing list. Join Hacksaw's Insiders Group. John, we've got a lot to cover, going a lot of different directions. And we're going to spin this as we get ready for actually wild card playoff games starting on Tuesday. On Tuesday. So we're kind of all wondering who the Padres are going to play. I mean, how's this breaking out, Lee? Okay, let's talk about what had to happen, what's still going to happen. The Padres, home field advantage, wild card round. They will face either the Mets or probably the Atlanta Braves. It's a weird set of circumstances. The Mets and Atlanta in a doubleheader today... If one of these teams wins both ends of the doubleheader, the winning team is in and Arizona gets in. If they split the doubleheader, Arizona goes and plays golf tomorrow. Hmm. Somebody's coming to San Diego. We think it's the winner of the first game today. Somebody's going to have to go to Milwaukee to play the Brewers in the other wild card game. So then it, it takes us to John's big question. Which is the toughest team to face? Well, the Padres, I think, are the most complete team in Major League Baseball. I wouldn't want to face the Padres, period, exclamation point right now, because of starting rotation, because of everyday lineup, because of bench bunch, and because of Mike Schilt. I think the Padres are really, really dangerous. But let's just presuppose it is the Mets. The Mets have got Peter Alonso and the home run hitting shortstop Francisco Lindor. Power hitting third baseman in Mark Vientos. They got Marte the hot-hitting young catcher, Alvarez, and they've got a unique collection of journeyman pitchers who have had bounce-back seasons. I would have never thought a rotation that would have included Sean Manaya, Jose Quintana, and some of these other guys. we still be playing baseball in October, but there we are. The Mets are really, really a complete ball club. Not equal to the Padres, but pretty good. Atlanta. They've gone from top of the hotel balcony, we're about to go to the wild card series, to lying face down in the basement, 
This game with the Mets, this first game of the doubleheader, back and forth, back and forth, absolutely amazing. And they're still playing as we take the air. But Atlanta's dangerous. They got Marcelo Zuna, and they got Matt Olson, and they got this home run hitting hero today, Ozzie Albies, and they got Jorge Soler. And that pitching staff, wow. We think the Padres have a good staff. Well, they got Chris Sale and Max Fried at the front end of that rotation. And they got Ray Lopez back off the disabled list right now. Atlanta's a really dangerous team. Arizona. Here's a big issue with the, with the D-backs. They've been battered by injuries the back third of the season. They finally have their full batting order back, but... They're not hitting the way they were before Christian Walker went out, before Gabe Marino went out. It's just not quite the same Arizona team. But from a pitching staff perspective, they got dangerous people. There's no doubt about it. Zach Gallon is as good as it gets in terms of being your number one starter. But it's been weird. They gave big money to Jared Montgomery. They gave big money to Eduardo Rodriguez. And both have scuffled with injuries. Neither one has been dominant. Neither one's earning the kind of money that they're being paid. So I'm not sure Arizona is really ready for postseason play this season, considering that those guys went uh, to the World Series last year. So it spins us back to the first game of today's Mets-Atlanta doubleheader, where Atlanta was leading 3-0 in the eighth inning. Scott Schellenbrock, or Spencer Schellenbrock was pitching really well. He had an 11-pitch at-bat, and he gave up a double, and he was gassed. They had took him out. The bullpen imploded. Joe Jimenez and Raciel Iglesias absolutely blew up in a Mets six-run eighth inning. So Atlanta was going from a 3-0 lead to a 6-3 deficit, and Atlanta came back in the bottom of the eighth inning and retook the lead. Ozzy Albies, who had hit a two-run home run earlier, came back with a three-run screaming line drive, bases loaded double to give Atlanta the lead 7-6. So they're going to the ninth inning right now. Atlanta wins. They're in. Mets still have to play a second game of doubleheader. They can get into the second game of the twin bill if they win that. So those are the storylines, this street corner, if you will. Now, the other street corner is Milwaukee sitting there, day off, the Brewers won 93 games this season. I would have never have imagined that, considering they lost virtually the whole pitching staff. But Willie Adamas, the shortstop, has had a phenomenal comeback player of the year season. Will and Contreras is at a ton of home runs. And this young shortstop, Jackson Cheerio, has hit with power. He's He's been the equivalent of what Jackson Merrill's been to the Padres. Milwaukee plant at home is going to be dangerous for anybody going in there. So, John, that's where we are. Do you want to give us a, an update on the out-of-town scoreboard? Uh, has Atlanta won? Have the Mets rallied back? Where are we in that first game of the doubleheader? Well, according to the sports ticker here, it just ended right now. So the Mets won 8-7. to seven. They just finished the full nine-inning slate, and I guess they're going to go take a break and come back in about an hour or so. What the that was a crazy game. I mean, that's like I, unbelievable back and forth from the eighth and in the ninth. Now, here's the big issue. Atlanta loses this lead twice and loses at home. Now you got a big question. Atlanta has to win the second game to have a postseason. And now Atlanta has to burn Chris Sale 17-3 and three, and start him today rather than the first game of the wild card series. That's a real setback for the Atlanta Braves. Can they do it? Sure. Sale's been unbelievably dominant. He's had his own career bounce back season, too. But what a blow. So the Mets are in, and I would assume that means the Mets are coming to San Diego regardless of what happens the second game doubleheader. Again, there's so many ifs and thens. I get confused by it all. But that sounds right. You know, and you look at both these teams, you're like, which one do you want? And, you know, like, pick your poison. So which one do you think is the scariest one uh, for the Padres to face. Well, if you asked me a month ago, I would have said the Diamondbacks. But now, I'm not really sure. I'm like, I just remember Chris Sale, when he pitched against the Padres, he just took them out. I mean, and besides, the Padres aren't so good against lefties. I'm worried about that. But beyond Chris Sale, the Braves look like a team that might be easier to beat. There is no Acuna, you know, rather than the Mets, who just are seen like they're red hot. Yeah, and it's hard for me. I look at the Mets and I say, how are they doing this? How is this possible? the Mets to do this, considering they got a bunch of journeymen in their pitching rotation. They don't have the number one starter. Kodai Senga has not pitched all season long. I mean, this this is really stun stunning to me. But 
it's a 26-man roster. You come together in, in this season, and the Mets collectively, there's not a lot of stars on that team outside of Lindor and maybe Alonso sometimes when he hits home runs when he's not batting 241. The Mets don't have a ton <laughs> of stars on their roster, and yet yeah. they're right there on the brink. Yeah, and I think they're still paying Bobby Bonilla. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and, and But, you know, it's the grimace. That's what it is, Lee. The grimace has kicked these guys off. So... It might be a rematch of 2022 Wild Card Series. Okay, that's where we are. It looks as if the Mets are coming to San Diego to play the Padres. And they still have a second game of the doubleheader to play. Atlanta has to win that to get into postseason. And Arizona, they're rooting for somebody to sweep this thing. They're rooting for the Mets to win it so Arizona can be in postseason play. Okay, as long as we're talking baseball, let's go from the National League. Let's talk about the matchups that actually are set in stone and begin tomorrow. American League playoffs. Yeah, I mean, you got, first of all, I'm surprised Kansas City is in there and the Tigers. Okay, let's start with Houston. World Series team. Are you going to boo now or you won't wait till I'm done? <laughs> he doesn't like the cheats. Uh, Houston has fought through a ridiculous siege of injuries. There was at one point in the season, the Houston Astros had six of their top seven starters on the DL. They're all virtually back, not all totally 100%, including Justin Verlander. And there's no Lance McCullers. But Houston, led by Framber Valdez and a bunch of young guys, has got pitching. Alex Bregman was hurt early. Jordan Alvarez, their other big bat, has been hurt in and out of the lineup. Altuve's been in and out of the lineup. And yet, Houston won their division, and Houston is hosting first-round playoffs. Detroit, you know... They were in trade mode at the deadline. They were so far out of it, biggest disappointment. And they won 15 of their last 20, the Tigers did. Unbelievable. Uh, They got one pitcher that you would recognize, Tarek Skubal. Won 18 games this season. They were going to trade him at the deadline. They elected not to. They got hot bats, though. These are not household names. I follow them, so I kind of know that how the seasons have had. Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, Matt Vierling. And their second and third starters are kids who are led by Reese Olsen, and they're pitching pretty well. But this is the Houston Astros who have a world of experience, and this is Detroit, starry-eyed. We're in the playoffs <laughs> with a really, really young team. So Houston goes against Detroit. Baltimore has been building. You know, they were miserable for four or five years in a row. Hell, one year I think they lost 115 games. And Mike Elias did a great job rebuilding that. Virtually their entire roster are their farm system draft picks. Not much in terms of free agency. You got Baltimore coming off 91 wins. Baltimore did go into the marketplace and get Corbin Burns to anchor uh, a very young pitching staff. Baltimore has survived the loss of three pitchers this season, including John Means, a former no-hit pitcher who's now had two elbow surgeries. They survived that, and they're playing tomorrow. Baltimore's got a great shortstop in Gunnar Henderson. Baltimore's got a whole bunch of complimentary guys that put the ball in play. Baltimore's a pretty good team. Kansas City rented a bunch of free agents. The Royals have a great shortstop in Bobby Witt. Their young first baseman, Vinny Pascantino, but he broke a thumb. They think he's going to be activated. He might be a DH tomorrow. Is going to try to play after doing all this intensive rehab. But their pitching staff has kind of run out of gas, and that includes Seth Lugo, who at one oh, point, yeah. I think, had won 15 games. The ex-Padre and absolutely stalled in the final month and a half of the season. All the innings caught up with him. I just don't know that Kansas City can go very far. But again, if Bobby Witt gets hot and some other guys get hot, maybe they hit their way through this. But I got I got Houston beating Detroit. I got Baltimore beating downtrodden Kansas City. And there's a lot of disappointment in a lot of other places. Minnesota was in the hunt. Hell, Minnesota was chasing Cleveland for first place and faded. I think they were 7-18 and 18 down the stretch. And a lot of rumblings in the Twin Cities that they blew this thing, and Rocco Bodelli might get blown out as manager. But th- that's how I view the American League. And John Riley says... I like seeing the new logos. I mean, you know, the, 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 we haven't seen the Royals since Hosmer and those guys won the whole thing. Baltimore, rel- did they were Baltimore in the playoffs last year? Yes, they, they were in and out, one and done real quick. But that's young team building, learning, and now takes the next step. Yeah, exactly. But it's been forever since Baltimore. And then the Tigers. I mean, so this is kind of cool. And yeah, boo, hiss on the Astros, the cheaters, the trash cans, the whole thing. But they are loaded and they will do well. But if you, if 
you ask me, I think I want the Tigers to win. Probably the Orioles. Maybe it might be their turn to have some fun. Okay, so you got you got Detroit. You're rooting with your heart rather than doing this podcast with your brain. Well, yes. Okay. So you spin back to the National League where we started this whole podcast. You got Milwaukee. You got the Padres, home field advantage. You got the upstarts who grinded in the last day of the season to get in. Who do you think is going to come out of the wild card in the American League and the National League? Well, I mean, first of all, in the National League, I'm obviously I'm rooting for the Padres. We're going to find out who they're going to play. The Brewers, though, are kind of like stealthy. You know, they're they're the number three C. There's you could probably name a few guys on that team, but you kind of not a lot of superstars. Kind of like the Mets. Yeah, for them to do it without Christian Yelich for half the season. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So you know, I I, I my hunch is is that. Okay, the Padres are going to win. And then in the other uh, wild card, I think that that other wild card team may get past the Brewers. Because Atlanta and New York, man, they're streaky. They could do it. Okay. Now, when we're done, baseball fan is invited to join us on Fans Forum. I can... I, Swami says, I, can, <laughs> I, I know what's going to show up on the screen. Fans Forum contributors will come back and say, you two big dummies, none of this matters because you got the Yankees and you got the Dodgers and you got the Phillies. And anybody getting out of the wild card round has to go through those places. Now, see, now you sound like Colin Coward. Thank you. You know, who's always homing for those big city teams. Okay. So Fans Forum, you're a baseball fan, rooting for the Padres. Got a different opinion about the National League and American League playoffs and the wild card teams that forged their way in. Or is this just a waste of time because you still got to play the Dodgers, the Phillies, or the New York Yankees? Baseball fans, join us in the chat box right now. Fans Forum Box is open for business. John, that's all things baseball. Are you ready for some football? Are you ready for some football? Here we go. A week of surprises. Oh, my goodness. Some good, some bad, some really ugly. Let's talk about some of the top games uh, this weekend in the National Football League. Jim Harbaugh is supporting Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert is a warrior. Charger quarterback shows such moxie. Playing on a bad ankle, dinged it again, stayed on the field. He couldn't do it by himself. At the end of the day, that's the big issue, as the Chargers gave up a 10-0 lead and lost to the Kansas City Chiefs. (laughs) Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes. Andy Reid, they find a way. They'll probe you and what didn't work in the first five possessions. They'll do something different in possession six through ten. And I guarantee you, once they get the lead, they don't give that sucker up. They go from a 10-0 deficit to beat the Chargers 17-10. Mahomes throws for 245 and a touchdown. Survive a couple of turnovers in the first 10 minutes. Chargers really played on the edge in the first 10 minutes. And their game went away. And then because they're all dinged up and their running backs were making mistakes... They went to the guy that was on the street corner a week ago, Kareem Hunt, former Charger, former Brown, comes off the bench and goes for 69 yards and catches a bunch of passes along the way. And the Chiefs go the length of the field to win the game. Beat the Chargers for the 11th straight time out here on the West Coast. Like I said last week, when is a rivalry not a rivalry? When he can't freaking beat the other guy. And Kansas City <laughs> just beats him and beats him and beats him and beats him here. Over and over again. Exactly. Uh, real problem with the Chargers. Running game has gone away. Had 20 rushes for 51 yards yesterday. Herbert playing on one leg through for 179. Nine penalty flags on the offensive line and the tight ends. That's what happens when you don't have your starting offensive tackles. Those guys made a lot of mistakes during the course of the game. Herbert, two sacks, nine hits, ten pressures. <laughs> Brutal. The guy was a warrior. End of the day, Kansas City posts the victory. Minnesota Vikings. I didn't see this coming. Not at Lambeau Field in Green Bay. They came out of the locker room with fire in their eyes. They scored four touchdowns in the first 21 minutes. Sam Donald looks like he's never looked like ever since <laughs> leaving USC to go to the National Football League. Donald winds up throwing three touchdown passes, throws for 275. Aaron Jones, the ex-Packer, comes back into Lambeau and gallops for 93 yards along the way. Jordan Love didn't have a lot of mobility. They fell behind 24-0. It was too big a hill for him to run up. 
Minnesota's defense picked off Love three times, who was forcing things because he couldn't move the pocket, also recovered a fumble. That's pretty impressive Minnesota win. Then we get to Sunday night football. I thought this was going to happen. Baltimore came out and just ran it down the throat of the Buffalo Bills. And I'd said all along, even though Buffalo had the nice 3-0 start and Josh Allen had not turned the ball over, I said, this is not a complete roster. They're asking him to do way too much. And what happened last night in a Sunday night game, Derrick Henry goes 87 yards for a touchdown the first time he touched the ball. First play. (laughs) Finishes with 199. That follows up the 152 he turned in last week. And Baltimore, which was 0-2 out of the gate, has now rearranged their offensive formations. And they're going to double tight ends. And they're going to run the damn ball. And Lamar's going to throw off the play action with double tight ends. You can't get to the quarterback. You better hope you can stop the running back. Baltimore's in four weeks. Baltimore's figured out how Derrick Henry fits with Lamar Jackson. That was a real dominant performance. Baltimore blasting those guys. Tampa Bay. Wow. Tampa Bay tears apart Philadelphia. Wow, do you think there's a little bit of heat on Nick Sirianni in the city of brotherly love, a.k.a. <laughs> brotherly hate? Wow, the Eagles are taking a lot of heat back there. Sirianni's taking a lot of heat. Baker Mayfield, who was found wanting about three different places yeah. he played, he goes off for 347 through the air and two touchdowns. Good for him. In the Tampa Bay win, his two receivers between him, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Caught 14 passes in the course of the game. And then there was the defense. This is Jalen Hurts, the Eagle quarterback. Moves the pocket, runs. I'm a dual-dimension guy. He got sacked six times. Turned it over. Two more fumbles. Eagles having a terrible time. They move the ball up and down the field. They're averaging over 400 yards a game. And they keep turning the ball over as they move the ball up and down the field. Sirianni is under all kinds of heat. Tampa trashes Philadelphia. Washington, what a victory for the Washington Commanders. They're going into Arizona, where Kyler Murray and those guys were feeling pretty good about themselves. Not anymore. Washington, 42, Arizona, 14. And Jaden Daniels, who does not make mistakes, he throws for 233, rushes for 47 more. His tailback, Brian Robinson, gallops for 101. And Washington just stomped the Arizona Cardinals. And everybody's paying attention to Jaden Daniels and say, holy cow. Only concern I have is he, he makes great decisions with pressure, moves the pocket. He runs too much. And at the end of the day, what happens to young running quarterbacks in the NFL? They get hurt. They get hurt. So far, so good. But I think they got to tone that act down. But boy, they're off to a quick start. I've seen a lot of stuff in all the years I broadcast NFL football. I've never seen this. I've never seen an NFL quarterback have minus seven yards passing in the first half. That was Bo Nix. Wow. And he had no sacks. He had minus seven. How does that work? Everything was check downs, tackle behind the line of scrimmage. It was unbelievable. He finished the game 12 for 22, 60 yards. 60 yards. Quarterback throwing for 60 in the NFL. A starting (laughs) quarterback. A number one draft pick quarterback. And they won. They beat the Jets 10-9 Ten to nine in the rain in a field goal kicking slop contest. Aaron Rodgers, gimpy. He's got an ankle and, and got the other leg and the ankle are both bothering him. He didn't do very well, and the Jets just, just could not move the football much at all. So that that is a bit of a surprise there. Denver beat Arizona with a quarterback who threw for sixty. Indianapolis, they jumped all over Pittsburgh. I looked up. I was watching one game. Had my laptop open. I looked up and the Steelers are down 17 nothing already in Indy to that quarterback, Anthony Richardson, who, by the way, got knocked out of the game again because he was running. Hurt. Yeah, yeah, running. Gets hurt. Yeah, exactly. But Indy came back behind that old dog, Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco. Joe yeah. Flacco. He's got to be north of 40 years of age. <laughs> he throws for 168 and two touchdowns. Colts defense chased Justin Fields all over the field, had four sacks. They recovered two fumbles, and the Colts upset the Pittsburgh Steelers. Fields did finish with 312 plus 55 rushing. He's getting progressively better. I don't think they have enough speed, skill, wide receivers to make that a great offense. Pittsburgh is still playing Neanderthal football, but the quarterbacks made progress. But Indy, behind the old dog Joe Flacco, posts the victory. And then the other marquee game was the Rams. And I knew it was going to catch up to him. I mean, 
Matthew Stafford has willed the Rams to victory, and he ran out of ran out of time. He ran out of opportunities. He's, they run out of players. I mean, they they got beat, and they kind of got beat up really badly by Dub Bears. Uh, Stafford finishes with two twenty four, but he got sacked three times, turned it over twice. Can't do it by himself. See, I mean, his top two wide receivers is tight end are all gone. Four offensive linemen are still on injured reserve. Just not good. Caleb Williams didn't do very much offensively yesterday, but DeAndre Swift did. Mm. He wound up with 93 rushing, 72 yards in receptions. And the Rams are now sitting there beat up and a quarterback that's starting to take a lot of hits with a 1-3 and three record. And one other note, if we're looking for how the hell did this happen, <laughs> how the Raiders beat Cleveland, but they did. Deshaun Watson looked terrible. Gardner Minshew didn't turn the ball over, and the Raiders kind of grinded their way to an ugly win, and a win is a win is a win, especially for those guys who desperately needed a win. So, John, I, I put a lot of stuff up there on the board. Just give me your response. Pick a game or two that either you were impressed by or surprised you or say, how the hell that happened? Well, the, the Sunday night game I thought was interesting with the Ravens and with the Bills. First of all, I love the comparison of Derrick Henry with Eric Dickerson. Sure. And I never really thought of that. The, the guys on TV made that comparison. It's very similar. Dickerson is a bigger guy, mm-hmm. 6'4", long strider. Henry is just a bulldozer. I would compare Derrick Henry a little bit more towards Earl Campbell than I uh, would Eric Dickerson. Interesting. Very, very different dynamics. They were both great. Yeah, so I mean, clearly, you get that running back, you know, Henry there on the Ravens, they looked dominant. But you just got to love, uh, you know, uh, Josh Allen. I mean, some of these plays he made, you know, we were swapping texts. There was one where he was like gotten shoved out of bounds in midair. He threw the ball like 30 yards, almost got a touchdown out of it. Watching Josh Allen, he's almost looks like a majestic statue, you know. Of, he's so you big. Know, He's big, tall, athletic. You know, it's like, uh, you know, Michelangelo's David, you know, when he's throwing the ball. So, uh, you know, you kind of root for him. But, yeah, the, the Bills are not anywhere near as good of a roster. And what's your reaction to what's, what's befallen Justin Herbert, who can't do it by himself, even though his, his heart says he can. His head and his body won't allow him to do it. He's got no help. Yeah, yeah, there's no way. And he, I, I saw some of the other players getting interviewed. They're all saying, hey, man, Justin Herbert's not on him. You know, he's our guy. Uh, but, you know, it's just it's the tr- so charging because I saw that they were up early and I thought, oh, here we go. Maybe a big upset. And then it went the other way. The bad news, though, for the Chiefs, what's up with Rashi Rice? Uh, they think a ruptured tendon in his knee. That's it was a good. hyperextension. The replay looked awful. Uh, I mean, it was just a fluke thing. He got hit by his own quarterback as they were scrambling to try to dive on a loose football. Just a bad, bad break for them for Kansas City. So tough, tough situation. Instant there. karma's going to get you. Oh, all the time. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Is that yeah, the first? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's what's going on in the NFL. Hey, fans form. Chat box is open. You're an NFL fan. Hey, pick one of the teams we've been talking about. Talk about your team. Want to talk about the Chargers? Jump on board. Feel free to jump on us. That's okay. We're, we take abuse. Uh, if you agree, great. If you disagree, that's even greater. We want to hear what you've got to say because John wants to argue with you. Hey, we get to halftime. This Monday bonus podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers. Nine stores to serve you in San Diego. John, just run through a checkbox of the things that Dixie Line has for people who are homeowners that are either making renovations, want to make replacements of things in the house. What are the hottest selling things Dixie Line has? Oh, man, the list is long. Lumber, building materials, power tools, doors, windows, kitchen countertops, uh, uh, bathroom cabinets, um, you know, just about anything you can think of that you would use to build in your home. They've got it. They've got pros. They've been in San Diego for over 100 years. Now they're expanding into Orange County. You've got renovation plans? Think about them for materials. You've got re- renovation plans want ideas think about them as your best friend and your consultant these are special people dixie line lumber we're back here as we get ready to start the second half of this podcast just a reminder when we're done for all of you new people who are joining us on live stream we want you to join us at the end of the podcast what we call fans forum and maybe you're unfamiliar with how you can post a comment that gets on the air here on our fans forum john just explain to them how the chat box works 
Yeah, so if you're on Facebook, if you're watching the live stream there or the live stream on X or the live stream on YouTube, just go into that comment section. Drop your take, question for Hacksaw. Got a lot of names already piling in. Richard, XX Revolution, Jason, Force Ghost, Fabio, Robert, Chris, John, Robert again. So if you got a question or comment, drop it in the uh, live chat, Facebook, X, or YouTube. And a couple of other reminders. My website, it's written right there. That's the address, LeeHacksawHamilton.com. When we're done with this podcast on Mondays or Thursdays, I want you to just punch up my website. Take a look at what I write, and it's there every morning. You start reading it every day, you'll know everything there is in the world of sports. And by the way, when you go to my website, there's a big orange box on the homepage. It's for you to register to join Hacksaw's Insiders Group. I'm really trying hard to have a get-together with our club, our Insiders Group, I'm trying to get John to agree to buy a shot of whiskey for everybody who comes. So stay tuned for that. Uh, By the way, I also want to remind you, share and subscribe. Tell everybody what we do. Mondays at 1 p.m., Thursdays at 1 p.m. with this podcast. And subscribe so you will get the alerts every time we put something up on the YouTube channel. We do that almost every day of the week. John, you ready for the second half of this podcast? Let's get started. Let's get started, man. You are such a pro. This is so fantastic. (laughs) Okay, let's go here. NCAA football. Yeah, amazing, amazing weekend ahead of us. Well, we were waiting for the big boys to play each other. And when they got done, Alabama went wild, putting away Georgia. I mean, that was pretty impressive what the Crimson Tide and that quarterback did. And I, th- I tend to think Jalen Milrow has probably pushed himself to the top of the Heisman Trophy balloting by virtue of an over 400-yard all-purpose day. And they just jumped all over Georgia. Christian Beck led a phenomenal comeback, but he wound up throwing three interceptions in the course of the game, and that turned out to be the difference. You know, Beck, Beck wound up with uh, 435 yards and the three picks. Milrow had 374 passing, 117 yards rushing, and Georgia's defense knew he was coming. That was an impressive Alabama win over Georgia. Knocked Georgia from the second spot in the rankings down to five, and they still got the teeth of the SEC schedule uh, to be played. Second item, Heisman Trophy candidates. I have a Heisman Trophy ballot. We'll be talking more about that as the season wears on. But boy, there's some other unique names that have shown up. This quarterback out of Miami has thrown his way into the Heisman conversation. His name is Cam Ward. He started a small college, Texas, Incarnate Word, an NAIA school. How does this kid get unrecruited? But anyhow, he put all these NAIA records up on the board, went to Washington State, played there two years. Really impressive in the Pac-12. Last year, graduate school, he elects to opt out of Wazoo, goes to the Miami Hurricanes. He's got them unbeaten. Cam Ward this weekend threw for 354 and four more touchdowns. Guy has, guy's made himself into a Heisman candidate. Obviously, I just talked about Jalen Milrow and what his accomplishments were against Georgia. Shadur Sanders continues to put up big passing numbers for Colorado, and the Buffaloes are off to a pretty good start. And the other dark horse name is the Boise State running back, Ashton Genty. He's had four 200-yard games, and it's not like Boise State is playing Idaho State of the Big Sky Conference. Mm-hmm. He's doing this against legitimate D1 teams. And he just ran, went off for 259 yards and four touchdowns against Washington State. So this bear is watching. I'd say right now those are probably the top five names. We'll see if some other quarterbacks surface as we move to the middle of the season, move to the second half of the season. From the Heisman, let's talk about the Aztecs. Mm. Patience. Mm. We need patience. The 12 Aztec football fans left in the community need patience. I, I don't mean to be cruel. Sean Lewis, it's, he's struggling. Uh, I don't know if the system's too complex, whether the play calls are right or not, but the Aztecs lost to a team that is kind of at their level, Central Michigan. They weren't playing Pac-12 people, and they just couldn't stay in the game. Uh, they, they move the football in spurts, and then they don't score. They play really hard on defense. The defense is on the field the whole damn time. And this weekend, they committed a bunch of personal foul penalties, which made it really, really hard for them to overcome. I still think they're going to be good. Danny O'Neill is really impressive for an 18-year-old freshman. 
He has no turnovers in four games. Wow. None. That's impressive. He's really accurate. Now, they're not doing well on third down plays right now, only 34% conversion. But, I mean, this is a star of the future. Lewis Brown, the transfer wide receiver from Colorado State, has become their big play guy. I, my only concern is they're asking Danny O'Neill to stay in that pocket while they run deep home run balls, and they're not hitting as many of those deep passes as you'd want. I want to know with the, with the speed that Sean Lewis has compiled on that roster, while you're, why are you not running slants? Why are you not running crossing patterns? Why are you not running up and outs? Because you put the fear of God in secondary that they got so much speed. You don't need to throw 51-yard passes. All you need is just to get first downs, get first downs, keep the damn defense on the field and wear them out. That has not happened. So I think Sean Lewis needs to reevaluate his play chart and start using some of the other wide receivers because, I mean, they've got so much skill guy. They're throwing to one tight end and they're throwing to Lewis Brown. That's like they're ignoring the rest of the group. I think he's got to expand those who are participating. USC, they booed the Trojans off the field at the Coliseum at halftime. They were losing <laughs> to Wisconsin. And they came out and Miller Moss came out possessed. Tell you what, firebrand of a leader. Big, tough kid in the pocket. Moves the pocket, makes throws downfield. When they got done, Miller Moss put on a passing show. 308 yards, three touchdowns. Trojans come from behind uh, to post a win over Bucky Badger in Wisconsin. UCLA, it, this is going to get worse before it ever gets better. I mean, they, they got trampled again this weekend. They got outgained 431 to 172 yards. Uh, this is a team that almost lost to Hawaii the first game of the season. Has lost three in a row since that point in time. Ethan Garbers, the quarterback, is turning the ball over. Now he's dinged up. They just don't have a lot of players. I, I don't know if UCLA is going to win a game in the, in the Big Ten going forward. And one other story. Would you please explain this to me? You're the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> I mean, that's why we have a podcast with all this technology. <laughs> smartest guy in the room. Why would the Mountain West Conference make a phone call. They're trying to add an eighth team after having lost Utah State plus San Diego State, Boise, Fresno, etc. They're trying to add an eighth team. Why would you call North Dakota State? Why would you call Texas State? Why would you... Is Was there an earthquake or something? <laughs> why is Northern Illinois Toledo, which I thought were in the Midwest, why are they considered a Mountain West, West Coast team now. That's who they're calling to try to get to be the eighth <laughs> member of the team of the conference. Why is the Mountain West doing that? makes no sense to me at all. No, no. I mean, well, geography doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. The the number on the end of your conference name, Pac-12, Big Ten, Big 12, that doesn't matter anymore. So it's just anything goes, you know. The Mountain West needs to pick a generic name, you know, so they don't get geographically linked. I can't believe Toledo and Northern Illinois coming here in this conference. That's as absurd as back in the day when San Diego State was going to the Big East. I said, oh, yeah, I, damn, I can't wait to start that rivalry in the Big East Conference with UConn football. Imagine being a player in Northern Illinois and you got to go fly to Hawaii yeah. to play football. I mean, that might be a nice vacation. But that's a hell of a trip. Yeah. So that's where we are. So, John, give me a quick spin. Pick a, pick a team, pick a topic. Uh, I know you have opinions. The Aztecs, I was just so in it for them. I was thinking they could really do it. And, the you know, the kicker, you know, had some trouble. He missed a couple of field goals. You can't put it all on that kid. But still, he would, this was a game you wanted them to win. And it was interesting, just generally speaking, watching that game in their stadium, which is a nice stadium there in central Michigan. And then I flipped the channel, and it's Georgia, Alabama. And it's like the freaking Super Bowl, man. And it's big time. Now you text me, it's big boy football. Here we go. You know, so it's interesting, the differences of the two. Um, but, you know, I, I really want the Aztecs to be successful. I like Sean Lewis and his enthusiasm. I want him to be successful. The other comment I'll make is I want that kid from Boise State to win the Heisman. Just like Marshall Falk got screwed by, um, who was it, Lee Corso, <laughs> you know, that wanted his guy from Miami um, to get you the— You Gino Toretta fan, Gino huh? Toretta, yes. You know, so the Aztecs got screwed. This kid from Boise State sounds like he's legit. I haven't seen him yet, but the wow. numbers are off the chart. He's a third year guy. He stayed. He didn't go to the NFL. I mean, wow. he is the best big running back. There's a highlight video from this past weekend's game against Washington State. He ran over 
seven different Cougar players on this long touchdown run. It's a phenomenal run. So Google it up, Google so boy. Is he like an Earl Campbell that bashes you over, or is he a fast guy? No, he's 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 physical. He's not Earl Campbell in terms of dimensions, but yeah. he's big and physical, and he's got an extra gear once he gets out there. He's he's like Falk. Falk was not as physical as Genty is. Falk was unbelievably lightning quick, and he had an extra gear when he got out to the second level or got to the sidelines and went. This guy will bang you and then bounce it out, and you one guy can't bring this guy down. He's just he's powerful. That sounds like Rashad Penny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's a better comparison. Yeah, that's yeah. very good. Yeah. Okay, so that's where we are in college football. Feel free to join us with an opinion. Fans Forum chat box is open. We're talking hoops. Hoops, yeah. A big trade in the NBA. I mean, this is a lot of people are talking. This is a real stunner. And I'll tell you, this is a portent of what can happen in the NBA and might happen in the NBA. I'm going to tell you about the trade, and I'll tell you how I'm going to link it to something else. There's a story out there. It's not gotten national recognition, but people should be paying attention. The Minnesota Timberwolves traded their big starting high-scoring forward. It, there were there were all kinds of issues with Carl Anthony Towns in terms of relationship with the other big guy, Rudy Gobert. Anyhow, Minnesota traded Towns, averaging 23 points and 10 rebounds a game, and a number one draft pick. They go to the New York Knicks for their unhappy shooting forward, Julius Randle, former number one pick, averaging 24 points per game, plus three-point shooter, Devante Vin, DiVincenzo. The big issue, and the story hasn't spilled out yet, Minnesota cannot afford to pay three guys $40 million apiece. And that's where the contracts with stars have gone. I mean, they have Anthony Edwards. They mm-hmm. have Gobert. They had Towns. Each was making between 40 and 43. Minnesota's ownership says we do not have the ability to create that kind of revenue to bring it in so it can go to the players. So they traded Towns. I don't think they got fair value back. Julius Randle is a streaky shooter, is kind of a bit of a head case, but they gave up on him. Connect the dots to this story. Boston Celtics won the NBA championship last spring. Phenomenal Mm. team came together. Everybody's contract kind of came up at the same time. Everybody's making $40 million. There's three stars on the team, plus all the support guys are making megabucks. That's why that family just announced, once they got to the championship parade over, we're putting the team up for sale. We can't afford. They're going to lose $80 million this season. The Celtics, the championship Celtics, with all the sponsorships and all the sell, they're going to lose $80 million this year because of the cost of the contracts. And suddenly I looked at the Minnesota story, and that was the first thing that flashed into my mind on the weekend was the NBA, even the glory of everybody making 40 mil, they're headed for disaster because there's no way to recoup all this money to pay all these guys. I mean, Boston's got three guys making 40, and the owners put the championship team up for sale at the peak of their success. And Minnesota has three superstars, and their owner says, can't do it. We're going to make a trade. I think NBA is headed for trouble. Anyhow, so that's that's the big story in pro basketball there. Your response? Yeah, well, it's clearly the Timberwolves um, you know, gave up a lot. I think the Knicks won the deal. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting, the money thing, because when you're first explaining, I'm thinking, okay, Minneapolis, not as big of a market, you know, but if Boston was struggling, now granted, I know for Boston, it's probably like a, a play toy for the billionaire owner. But at some point, you can't, you got to say, hey, man, we can't keep giving money away. Um, it's it's fascinating how, how all these pieces are rolling together. Because I remember, like the Lakers roster is loaded. That's one of the most expensive in the league, right? Well, they got yeah, but the, they got two guys making all the money. The rest of the guys are way down the chart. But even the guys way down the chart are still pulling like twenty million a yes. year, which is just an unbelievable. So I don't know. I don't know what this means for the NBA. Man, they got to figure out a way to get more revenue. I think there's a problem on the horizon. I really do. Wow. And it. Again, the union has a right to negotiate under your form of capitalism to get every dollar you can get out of the owner for every player. Yeah, of course. But now when you got two of your marquee teams say, we can't afford this, we're losing too much money, paying what the union wants us to pay, mm-hmm. game's going to change. Something, yeah. Something's got to change. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, you're an NBA fan. You follow pro basketball. Who do you think got the better of that trade? And do you agree or disagree with me? There's a problem on the horizon in pro basketball with the salary structure, not just with the stars, but for everybody else, that's one topic. Next one. I, I, this news is tough, man. I mean, uh-huh. I really liked Kembe Matombo. 
Uh, what a personality. He passed away at the age of 58, a uh, brain cancer. Um, this was a unique player, came from small college basketball to the NBA and changed the game defensively. He was not only a great defensive player, good teammate, he became a persona. He became the first global ambassador for pro basketball around the world. Yes. Not just in his home country in Africa, but around the world. So when he retired, he played 16 years in the league, started and had unbelievable success with Denver, moved to other places, including Philadelphia and uh, to the Houston Rockets. When he retired, he went to work immediately for then Commissioner David Stern. He has done so much institutionally for charity. He has built hospitals in the Congo, which is his home country, Wow! in Sudan, in Ghana. He has done things to help finance scholarships for African students at those universities there, a Dikembe Mutombo scholarship fund. Wow. And he's done so much for charity here in the States, especially especially hospitals. What just what an unbelievably unique man. Uh four time All Star. Well, I think one of the great modern day defensive big men in the league. Negligible on offense, but what he did to change the game, I think I think he's number two all time in the history of the NBA in block shots. I think he's number four in the history of NBA rebounding. And not only was he a great player, but God, what a great citizen. And to see him pass away so suddenly at age 58, sad. I didn't even know he was ill, yeah. you know, but I, I just like the whole wagging the finger thing, you know, yeah. when he was like, you know, snuffing people with block shots, but yeah, and the TV commercials that followed that. Oh yeah. So th this is what's so great about it. Like if first, I had him here, he listened to some of the things you'd say he'd be doing this to you. <laughs> yeah, he would be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'll say, I'll say this first. I remember him at Georgetown where there were the three centers in a row. Yeah. There were yeah, all him, Alonzo Mourning and Patrick. Yeah. So that, that he was amazing there, but then. To your point, you know, he's from a foreign country. He comes to the United States. He's having success at basketball. And a lot of times it's, that's a big thing, you know, for a foreign person to come here to new culture, new everything new. And boy, did he just embrace America and America just embraced him back. And I and I, the fact that he became popular and had his commercials and did the, the media work just made me love him more. Because he was an American that loved America while he was here, you know. So I just think he was a great guy. I think of him mostly with the with the Hawks, though. That's sure. the team I connect him with. And I'll tell you what, he's up in heaven today with John Thompson talking basketball. There you oh, go. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'd yeah. be a conversation worth checking out. And by the way, one other side note to Dikembe Mutombo. Hmm. Hell, he ought to come in and sit here and do this. He speaks nine languages fluently. Nine languages. Dude's Some brilliant. of us in the studio don't speak one and a half very well. <laughs> you speak sports data language very well. But yeah, I mean, that's awesome. What a guy, Matumbo. Yeah, yeah, rest in peace. So we got that story to talk about. Uh, memories of the big guy. Feel free to join us on the Fans Forum podcast chat box. One other basketball story, and we got to cover this. We got to talk about this because this is not a good good optic. Yeah, WNBA more with Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark goes public this past weekend. You know her season just ended. I mean, she has helped take this WNBA to a much different level in terms of notoriety, in terms of TV ratings, in terms of season attendance, etc. She went public this week and said this has to stop. She says virtually every arena that every WNBA team goes into is filled with people who think they have a right to buy the ticket and stand there and scream racial overtones or things about lesbian gay life towards the women that play in the WNBA. And she said the amount of abuse that she took, she never mentioned it during the course of the season. She didn't want to be distressed. She said it, it's unfair. It's unfit. And the owners and the security people need to clamp down and to stop this from happening. And then on top of that, Brittany Griner, who, of course, has had her own personal life of trauma and got back here after being arrested in Russia, back here echoed the exact same thing, said the things that have been said to our players are so uncouth 
Those people should never be allowed to be back in the arena. And she, she's demanded the WNBA upgrade security, especially near the bench area. She says, There's just too many people, John, that think I can buy a ticket and I can do anything I want and say anything I want. And they're then and two of the stars of the league really offended. What the hell's wrong with these people? I mean, it. It's you know you go to a ballpark or a, a, you know a big arena watch a watch a ball game and you're going to hear crap from people but this is like in the gutter this has no, you don't need this at, at, a, at an entertainment event these people must show up trying to think that they're better than someone else and the WNBA is so much to celebrate you know it's you hate to have to have this as a discussion topic yeah you're correct and you know we started the season with all the electricity and the interest of what Caitlin Clark created. And it was promptly shut down by all the abuse she had to take because all the other women in the league were cheap shot fouls and running their mouths and all that. <laughs> now, that kind of went away about three weeks into the season. It died off when everybody realized this is a great player. Yeah. And look, she's made this a great league. But now all of a sudden we get to the end of the season and the playoffs and all this dirt surfaces again. And it's just, you know, it's just not, hey, Caitlin Clark. Go back and pick some corn. I mean, it's much deeper than that. It's racial stuff, and it's about the lesbian and gay community. Well, that is our society today. They make their choice. It might not be your choice. But what are you doing screaming at the bench about being gay? That's that's so far off off the chart. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you hate to have the the ownership and the management of the teams have to police the people to say, don't say that. In our, I mean, that it gets even crazier. But what the hell is wrong with these people? They're coming to a game to have a good time and you're just zinging racial epithets and that's what makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah. I mean, Kate, the- Caitlin Clark went to security twice at the end of the season, different games towards before the playoffs started. She went to security and said, that guy is shouting lesbian and gay negative comments towards our bench, our team. So, you know, get him out of here. got him out of here. So these guys get beard up and I'm a man. I'm going to talk about you being black or you being gay. Well, remember that happened at a Padre game with Dom, a Tommy Pham? Sure. You know, that, so you see this kind of crap every once in a while. It's like, geez. But I think for a player, if a player wants to go to the point of singling out someone to get out, and I say, yeah, that person gets out. Okay. So we go from basketball. You got an opinion about the greatness of the WNBA season, how neat it was, or how sad it is that they have to deal with some of this. Join us in Fans Forum. Hockey camps are open. Here comes the opening of the NHL season. And we got hockey hotline stuff to talk about. Boy, John, not a good, not a good weekend. We talked on Friday about the terrible injury to Drew Doughty. Uh, the all-star defenseman, maybe Hall of Famer with the LA Kings. Now they've gone in to do the, they've done all the exams. He's got major surgery coming. Not only has he got a fractured ankle, he's got torn tendons in the ankle. He may not play this season, and Ooh. that's that's a huge blow. The other one we talked weeks ago about this controversial trade, where the Montreal Canadiens got Patrick Laine mm. from the Columbus Blue Jackets in this huge trade, and Laine is is a guy. It's a big-time goal scorer, has had all kinds of personal issues. He got hurt in a Montreal preseason game against Toronto the other night. An open ice knee-on-knee check. A Toronto rookie stuck his knee out, and Liney hit it. And Liney's got a really bad knee injury. I don't know if it's a fractured kneecap. Uh, there was a huge fight payback in the aftermath of that. But that's a terrible blow because this guy scored 209 goals in about five and a half years in the NHL. And even though he's had personal issues, that's a, that's a really good player. Montreal's really counting on Patrick Laine to be a star. So NHL season opens in a week, but boy, what a terrible blow for the Kings. And this does not look like it's good news up in Montreal. You know, I heard someone tell me one time, I never forgot this, that the NFL will get to hook the sedan show. NFL is like modern day gladiator games. Mm -hmm. I wonder maybe is the NHL a better representation of that? Because these dudes, man, the abuse they take, the injuries. I mean, which do you think is the more, um, like I say, physically abusive sport? I think the NFL is because it's a much wider field and guys are running at full speed. Yeah, granted, they have pads and they do wear helmets and they've tried to outlaw helmet hits and all that. But you're still going to get unbelievable violent collisions along the way. The NHL is in a confined chunk of ice, 200 feet by 80 feet, mm. and that's it. Uh, but they, you know, they mandated helmets, they mandated visors, 
this year in all the minor leagues, in addition to the junior leagues, have not done it in the NHL. Everybody must wear throat guards because you get players who get hit, get up in the air, skates fly through the air. And, we, of course, we had the death of the NHL player who played in England last mm-hmm. year. So it's, there's, I think the, the NHL and the NFL have both done a real strong job in terms of lessening head blows, giving the players better equipment to wear. But it's a high-speed contact sport. And the NHL has made tremendous strides in terms of, I can't hit you in the head. I can't cross-check you and send you head first into the boards mm. uh, where you could get a head injury, a neck injury, etc. And some sometimes skate cuts are accidents. Sometimes high sticks are accidents and incidental. But that stuff happens. And you can't. You can't go knee-on-knee knee check. You can't stick your leg out as Patrick Laine is coming across with the puck across center ice and check him with your knee and put knee on knee. Hell, I'd never do that because I'd blow my knee out, much <laughs> less hurt him. Mm. So there's great risk. But this incident was pretty, pretty ugly. And it's a big blow to Montreal because that's an $8 million a year guy against the cap who I don't think they're going to have for maybe half the season. It looked, it looked really bad. Brutal. Brutal. Okay, so that's hockey. Feel free. Oh, Canada Network, you're joining us. You want to jump in talk about that? Last topic on the table. We're going everywhere. The high-speed sports <laughs> wire. Here it is. <laughs> hey, we've been talking. We talk a lot of soccer here. <laughs> Christian Pulisic, he's done something no American has done over there. Over there this year, is he plays for AC Milan. He scores five goals in straight games for AC Milan. No American's ever done that. That's awesome. Five goals in five games. I mean, he has grown. That's the coolest thing. We, we've been doing this podcast almost two years. Hmm. And we talked about the young 18-year-old who was then a 20-year-old, and he looked scared and terrified playing for the U.S. national team, who got better and better, and he went to Chelsea, and then he went to Germany. Now he signed in AC Milan. That's a man. To see him grow from an 18-year-old that I first followed and said, well, yeah, he's a gangly kid who can run. And I see him grow into a man. and be a, He scored five goals in five games at that level. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. Strange story in auto racing. Well, I don't know that we know the end of this completely. Michael Andretti has sold majority control in his IndyCar team to one of his co-owners. It's a, it's a really weird story. Uh, Andretti has run a three-race, three-car team. Set some marginal success recently prior to that. Had great success. He, of course, was a great driver, you know, and, his, and Mario Andretti, his father. Uh, Michael's been embroiled trying to get a charter to be one of the members, to be the 11th team in Formula One, has run into all types of political problems with the European ownership that doesn't want him there. They don't want to split the TV revenue, etc., though he would be a great poster boy for F1 coming back here. He sold it. He sold the majority control. The rumor is he's furious at Roger Penske, the legendary owner uh, who Penske owns the entire IndyCar racing business. Mm. Penske owns the 500. Penske owns its IndyCar team and its NASCAR team. Um, He just does not think that Roger Penske has done a good enough job marketing the sport. He's upset that outside of the Indy 500, the rest of the IndyCar schedule is kind of off the radar. It's kind of meaningless. Yeah. And he's upset all of a sudden that Formula One, with all of its money, has come in and planted a flag here in the United States Mm. And gotten record TV ratings, and more people are paying attention to F1 and Max Verstappen and the angry Team Red Bull storylines, and they're paying attention. He's correct. Yes. I and mean, I've, I've covered IndyCar racing since Fido was a pup. I grew up in IndyCar racing. I know all about it. It just it's, doesn't have the impact. It's not on the people's radar. And what they need to do is they need to rework the schedule— and if you, they only run, I want to say, 12 to 13 races a year. It's not like NASCAR that runs 36 or F1 that runs, I think F1's running 32. What they need to do is fix their calendar and make the marquee events, make it the first Sunday of every month there's an IndyCar race. Don't go six weeks on the schedule without a race and then run two races in one weekend in Milwaukee. That's weird. So they, and so maybe his critique of Penske has got some validity to it from a marketing perspective. they got to change the image of IndyCar racing aside from the month of May. So there's a lot of work to be done, but he's walked away. I'm, I was really surprised at that. And then there's the last one. 
the owner of the Chargers, <laughs> your best friend, Dean Spanos. Big, about a year and a half ago, big story broke. His sister, Dia, who owned 24% of the franchise, family ownership, owns most all the stock. She went public and said, this man has ruined the product. This man has ruined the business. This man has got debt everywhere. This man left San Diego. This man had to take out all these loans to pay the beginning of the territorial fee to move to Los Angeles. This man had to borrow money uh, to meet his bills. This guy's borrowing one from one bank to pay off another bank loan, saying that Dean Spanos needs to be removed. Well, they fought and they fought and they fought. She's given up the fight, but she sold 27% of her stock in the franchise and the Spanos Foundation to the owner of the Detroit Pistons, Tom Gores. And Gores has become the lead minority owner. Dean Spanos, first family of football, will continue to make all the (laughs) football decisions Mm. about a franchise that's not had a hell of a lot of success. But Dean Spanos has walked out. And I've tried to configure, and I was never good in new math, because I cut math class that day in college and went drinking uptown that day too. I I don't know what the value is, but it's got to be... If if the franchise is valued five point six billion, you do the math. Get your lap uh, your uh, cell phone out. What is twenty seven percent of six point five billion? That's what she got. Oh, that's about you know one and a half uh, billion. It's probably more than that. Yeah, but yeah. anyhow, that's the story that broke. It hasn't gotten a lot of publicity because when the when the lawsuit story broke, she sued, tri- filed I think three different pieces of litigation. And they were never going to settle it, and, and the league was never going to force the first family of football to sell the franchise. But anyhow, she has sold it and made significant profits. Well, good. Yeah, good for her. If she good deserves her, it, I guess. Yeah. Um, it, it, first of all, I, I, the, the Spanos family is just so weird. Like, like there's Dean and Dia. And they're spelled the same with the exception that Dean has an N on the end. Right. And Dia is just D-E-A. What's and, going and then on? And there's another brother, Michael. And there's a fourth member that lives in Stockton, and they own, I want to say now, they must own 76, maybe, percent of the stock. And now Tom Gores has bought Dia's ownership of it. And there's one family here in San Diego uh, that still owns the team, have owned it since the days of the old AFL, Baron Hilton, San Diego Chargers. Yeah, George, um, oh, yeah, I can't remember. I, re- I remember this, this guy, yeah. Great gentleman. He's passed on. His family still owns it. So that's where we are with the Chargers. So you want to talk about uh, Pulisic, Andretti? No, no, I want to talk about the IndyCar Andretti thing because, like, when I was a kid, the Indy 500 was everything, right? Sure. You know, and, and this is before, for me, and NASCAR was big. I, you know, frankly, back when I was a kid and even today, I don't really care about the rest of the IndyCar circuit. I just care about the Indy 500 month of May. and all the pageantry. We talk about that. We enjoy all that. So it makes me wonder is like, why is why is there an IndyCar league and an F1 in, in Europe? I mean, they're very similar kind of cars. Why can't they just standardize on and make all of IndyCar F1? Well, F1 is all road racing. F1 is much different technology, much more expensive, much more powerful cars. IndyCar is oval and road. Uh, the oval is obviously where the speed and the excitement is, but it, it, it's maybe it's cyclical, but IndyCar has gone through a really bad time in terms of losing its notoriety and its specialness aside from the old brickyard in the month of yeah. May. NASCAR was a good old boy thing. It was a regional franchise. It grew and it became a national thing thanks to TV. And of course, they had personalities, you know, the man in black, Dale Earnhardt and all those guys and the Alabama gang and Bobby Allison. Now, NASCAR's TV ratings have kind of plunged, even though it's a national sport. We don't have a NASCAR event on the West Coast anymore in Southern California. Hmm. For all the population and the TV viewers, we don't have a race because the track is is being downsized in, in Fontana. There's been wild talk about doing a street race, but I don't know that street races excite anybody. So now NASCAR's TV ratings are dipped, and here comes all things Europe and all things F1 and all things Max Verstappen and Sir Lewis Hamilton, and they're coming here. They're they are they're going to have five F1 races here in North America, I think within two years. So suddenly. F1 has become the oh, social yeah. thing. And, of course, F1 is global. F1's in Brazil. F1 is everywhere in Europe. 
I mean, it's fascinating. You know, F1's in, in Japan. So it, my, my wife watches F1 because she watched that Netflix series yes. and got hooked on it. With And my, she and my son are always talking F1. And I'm like, I, I have my hands full keeping track of everything else. But yeah, yeah. we've noticed that on this podcast, yes. <laughs> so uh, it, it is, you know... The personalities drive the sport. You're right. And and like, I can't even name an IndyCar guy because it's usually those dudes from Brazil. There's that, what, Pato Award from Mexico. Mexico. But I'm trying to think of some of the other names. They're not off the tip of my tongue. It's it's just gone through a cycle where we've got some great foreign guys who've come here and have done very, very well. Alex Palou is the latest. Oh, yeah. He won the points championship this year. But it just it's it's a bad cycle in IndyCar racing. But to have Andretti walk away from it, uh, he's, he's not, like, not going to be in day-to-day control of his team. He's going to be a minority holder. So, that, And I, I tend to think maybe some of the stuff he's saying about the lack of marketing and creative juice, oh, they yeah. need to do something to put IndyCar back on the calendar. And I mean, I, I follow it because I write about it on my website yeah, a lot. Do. But you go six weeks without an IndyCar race, out of sight, out of mind. Totally. Instead totally. of first Sunday every month in IndyCar, yeah. make it work on the schedule. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you're an auto racing fan, soccer fan, jump on board. Fans Forum box is about to be opened. Hey, this podcast is brought to you by Dixieline Lumber and Home Centers, nine store locations to serve you in San Diego. You got projects, they got materials, you need ideas, they can be your best friend, be your consultant. Whether it's in the house, at work, or even on the back patio by the pool, think Dixieline Lumber. This uh, podcast on Mondays and Thursdays at 1 p.m., And it's time for what we created that you must like because the damn box is filled with people with opinions. It's called Fans Forum. John Riley, it's yours. Here we go. It's going to start off with Robert. He said, has there ever been a game and a year as 2024 Mets and Braves game today? Padres want Sale to pitch today and not tomorrow. Well, it's amazing. I mean, it's this comeback thing. It was 3 nothing in the eighth inning. I was on the highway making my way, coming back from a press conference to come do the podcast. And it was 3 nothing, And I turned around. All of a sudden, the Met, you know, the Mets had six. I said, oh, this sucker is over. They're going to have to play the second game of the doubleheader. And then Atlanta comes from behind, thanks to Ozzie Albies again, and gets a lead. And then Lindor solves it in the top of the ninth inning. Uh, and, you know, from the Mets and the Atlanta perspective, they got a problem. Now they've burned through their bullpens. I mean, they are going to be breathing fumes by the time somebody gets to San Diego. Um, you know, there had been conversation, John, over the weekend. I was told there was conversation maybe MLB might move the start of the Padre NLCS back a day to give whoever has to fly cross country again a chance to collect themselves. But then MLB said, no, we're going forward. The games are going to be played and the Padres are going to start on Tuesday like everybody else is going to start on Tuesday. So, I mean, from the Mets' perspective, this is really hard because they were in Atlanta, although they sat and got rained out for two days. That's why they had a doubleheader today. Sat in Atlanta, went to Milwaukee, got kicked in the in the head in Milwaukee, got on the plane, came back to Atlanta late last night, played two today, get on the plane at about 6 o'clock tonight and come all the way out here and got to be at Petco Park tomorrow afternoon for a 5.38 p.m. start. So, I mean, the Mets are at a real disadvantage now. Yeah, well, we just I just check on my phone because we kicked this podcast off in the bottom of the ninth of game one. Game two, sales not pitching. You know, oh. you know, Holmes is pitching. And then um, right now the Mets are pitching Joey Lucchese, our old friend from the Padres. So they're probably throwing in the towel. Uh, so this may end up to be a split, but so far it's no score in the second. Um I want to just kind of roll the clock back. Um, those, this games, they are being uh, the doubleheader. These are from rainouts previously in the year, not from this recent hurricane, right? No, it was. Oh, it was. Yeah, the Mets were in Atlanta as that storm was heading in, and they got rained out two nights in a row. Okay, that's what it is. So it's a very recent. Yeah, it was when, Wednesday, Thursday got rained out. They had to go to Milwaukee to play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then come back here for the Twin Bill today. This is not from months oh, ago. Okay, so there's really no other way they could have probably figured out a way to make this work. Exactly. Wow. So I know I I, I thought it's good that they didn't move it, you know, I mean, as a Padre fan selfishly, but but also as a baseball fan, you know, it just creates more drama. It's going to be a lot more interesting whoever rolls here in. You're just big on drama. You're drama. Big, on, big on issues. Well, then we have something to talk about, you know. Okay, so. thanks for the input, Rob.
Next one. Okay, and so John said, yeah, the second game between the Braves and Mets are going to have a hard time living up to game one. Yeah, and I want to know who the hell is going to pitch. When do they call the third baseman in to pitch? I mean, they're both, they burn through their bullpen. Who's going to be able to throw tomorrow? We ask her, close it or throw 31 pitches in the eighth and ninth innings today, and they got lit. Both their closers got beat up. Who the hell is going to pitch game one if you have to go to the bullpen against the Padres? You know, back when I was a kid, Following baseball, starters used to always go seven innings, eight innings. You weren't always really worried about bullpen arms. But these days, it's a different beast. It's a different game. It was a different game, yeah, because you even con- concerned about Schilt and overusing his you know, high leverage guys. Yeah, this is, this is all just great drama here. I'm loving it. A lot of things change. I remember three cents postage stamps. Okay. <laughs> I remember as a kid growing up on Long Island, 18 cents a gallon gasoline and gas wars. 18, 18. cents a gallon. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think I'd look, furthest back I go is 49 cents. Yeah. I think your newspaper once upon a time was five cents. Now I do not other newspapers still out here to buy. <laughs> and at times are different. Hey, John, thanks for the input. Next question. Okay. Thanks for him. Let's go to Chris. Saw John. If the season ended today, Sam Darnold would be the MVP of the league for the first time in his career as receivers that people have heard of. However, I'm convinced his success is emanating from none other than his glorious mustache. <laughs> Lee, break down uh, for us the performance enhancing powers of the mustache. When you're great, you're great. I, I, I Should I tell this story? So I, I text with a lot of people, ex- executives, different sports. So I saw a picture weeks ago of A.J. Preller. Kind of looked like an Errol Flynn mustache. So I texted him and I said, listen, I, that's an okay picture. But if you need help with that mustache, call me. <laughs> You you and the mustache, that goes back how far in time? 1970s, doing hockey, when I had long hair and a Fu Manchu, which was everybody in hockey had that back in the, well, the, in the days 70s, of the Broad yeah. Street Bullies, the Phillies and the big uh, the Flyers and the Big Bad Bruins. Mm-hmm. So I had it and I started, I only shaved it off once. Uh, it was right after I got married and I was going on vacation to my cottage and we're getting ready to go the night, night of the midnight flight. I always fly overnight and... I said, I had to take this off. So I shaved it off. I look like a car without hubcaps. <laughs> and I peeked around the corner and I scared my wife. She said, what happened? She said, you were trimming to make a mistake. I said, no, nah, I just thought, it, but I grew it right back and I've had it ever since. So, hey, it's part of who I am. What, what do you think it, about Sam Darnold? This is amazing. This is the Kevin O'Connell effect. This is the guy I thought coming out of USC we would see in the NFL, but it shows the complexities of bad team, high pick, drafting a quarterback, look the hell what happens when you put a good young quarterback around bad players. And it just had no talent, no run game, couldn't protect him, you know, and he's going through a brutal learning curve about where's the blitz coming and what's my pre-snap read. And I mean, it's just, he, there's a confidence failure there that was terrible, but that was on, that was an organizational failure. So now he's a veteran. So now he's got a little bit more experience and obviously He's with a pretty gifted, smart guy, La Costa Canyons, Kevin O'Connell, and they're off and running. I, you know, he's he's obviously got maybe the elite receiver in the league right now, and in, in, uh, Justin Jefferson. And I'll tell you, the kid from USC, Jordan Addison's a hell of a player. They don't have their tight end yet. And he's going to be back within a couple of weeks. Hawkinson. Suddenly, that's a really dangerous offensive unit they've got. A little surprise Minnesota's doing so well defensively because they lost their top pass rusher. Daniel Hunter, he went to Houston as a free agent, and they've lost a lot of guys off that defense because of salary cap issues. But wow, Darnold sure looks like the real deal. Whether you'd like him or don't think this is going to work out, you can't take away the fact they got four wins already. Government's not going to come and reclaim those four victories. <laughs> I'm happy for Kevin O'Connell and for Darnold. Yeah. But was Darnold there before McCarthy got hurt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he signed. He was supposed to go into be the quote insurance policy. Ah. And you know he went to the OTAs the same time McCarthy went to the OTAs, and McCarthy was playing okay, and then McCarthy suffered the knee injury and is gone for the year. And now they're lucky they got that insurance policy in Minnesota because that insurance policy is now four and zero as a starter. Wow. Hell yeah. 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 
Okay, let's keep going here. Let's talk uh, Aztecs. This is with Force Ghost Fabio. Aztecs football choked that game away. The kicker gave me flashbacks of that Miami game back in 1990. Oh, what was his name? Andy, the field goal kicker that missed a couple of critical kicks. And he was a good field goal kicker. But at the end of the day, I I asked uh, Sean Lewis at the press conference today, because uh, Rose is kind of off the bloom now. It's hardly anybody going to those press conferences. Mm. It's me and Kurt Kenny from the Union Tribune, uh, one guy from the website East Village Times, and one camera. That's all showing up. Uh, so I'm not going to say San Diego State's lost the media, but not much of it, many of us there, but some of us are still coming. But I asked him today, what's the, what's the biggest phrase this week uh, in the Aztec uh, Center? And he said, well— so I gave him multiple choice. I said it's learning curve, coaching, confidence, or or what was the third one? Oh, he asked me too quick. I gave him three choices and teachable moments. He said that check n- number three, teachable moments. We just have to learn how to cope with what's going on and don't let one bad play become a second bad play, et cetera. You know, and they, they put out the fire at least last week with all the offensive line penalties, but that was replaced by all this junk, all this cheap stuff that happened with personal fouls on defense. I mean, they had a kid throw a punch. The whole world saw the punch, but a mid-American conference referee didn't see the punch. They have one of their corners should have been thrown out of the game. You know, plus they had helmet hits, they had late hits, they had roughing the quarterback hits. So he's got his hands full right now. And I don't like I don't like the play calling because they're they're asking that kid freshman quarterback to stand in the pocket and let receivers run their deep routes. A, the kid could get cleaned out, get hammered, or B, you're asking them to throw it deep with they're completing less than fifty percent on bombs. And as I said early on, you got all the speed, his wide receivers and his tight ends, throw slants, throw up and outs, throw crossing patterns. You know, wear the damn defense out rather than stand back there and try to throw it 38 yards down to Lewis Brown, complete one out of four, one out of five of those passes. So Sean's going through, I think he's going through a rough time, but I'm not giving up on him. I still think at this level, with that playbook and the number of athletes, I still think San Diego State is going to have a decent season. But dude, you're one and three. I'm not one and three. <laughs> Your turn. You're undefeated. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you got to have patience with this guy, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, he's brand new. I mean, we we're all spoiled from Rocky Long and, and, uh, and Brady, Brady Hoke, you know, and all the, you know, with the, over the 2000 teens, they were just such a great run. And yeah, we've got to take two or three steps back. And I think that's what we're in. It must be just so hard to build a culture, you know? And then and then the players you're recruiting, you know, you got to, a lot of these players have a chip off their shoulder. And maybe that's why they're getting in some fights a little bit, you know, trying to prove that they're legit. I just think you, you stay the course, you continue to teach them. I do think you need to open the playbook a little bit more. And once they start to win, they're going to win because this confidence will continue to grow. They're playing hard right now. That defense, unfortunately, is on the field too much. I think there's 133 teams in Division I. San Diego State is 129th in time of possession. Oh, my God. Fourth worst time of possession team because you go fast. But, dude, if you go three and out— your defense got to come back on the field. Right. And of course, Sean's response is, yeah, but if I score a touchdown in three plays, my defense has to come back on the field. I said, you know, Lee, you got to got to balance this out. I say, yeah, but you're 129th in, in time of possession. Right, right. All right, next question. Next question. Let's move on. Let's go to Jason. Uh, this is Padres. Was so nice to see Suarez throw change-ups the other night to get the save. Finally. Well, they, they, he's, he's got a master location with the other pitches. Because if he masters location with what he's doing, whether it's change-ups, curveballs, sweepers, whatever you want to call it, that's going to make the velocity look even stronger when they start guessing what the hell's coming. All of a sudden, it's 101 miles an hour in on your fist. But he's he's got to get consistent with location to be trustworthy. So, hey, but they get a day off. They'll all be refreshed. First game of the playoffs, 538 tomorrow night. You know, I just remember his first game for the Padres. He had to close a game in Arizona. He this got like, lit. And he got lit. Yeah, and I felt really bad for the guy. And then he really turned it on, and, and he's he's got the skill. You know, and that fastball has got so much life on it, but it's as straight as a bullet. So, yeah, he needs to develop that off-speed stuff. I, I just... I would hate to have a, a horrible problem in the playoffs with him. That would be that would be tough. Well, 
They got quality starters and they got depth of numbers. They just got to make sure when they hit the, the phone call to the bullpen that that's the night that Suarez is on or that's the night that Tanner Scott is on or that's the night uh, that the other setup guys are going to be on. We'll see. But they got numbers and they're not operating on fumes like the Mets or the Braves pitching staff will be coming in to Petco Park. Keep the faith, baby. Yeah, but let's also be realistic here. I mean, before we order World Series rings, uh, let's be realistic. Whatever we're going to get accomplished has to go through Dodger Stadium or Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we do, yeah, we got a lot to go. I don't want to throw cold water on you and ruin the carpet. Okay, uh, let's next question. Go to Richard here. And he says, when it comes to Major League Baseball marketing their brand, why on God's green earth would you not reseed so that L.A. and San Diego could be a possibility for the NLCS rather than knock another off in the divisional series? Shake him my head. Well, I guess that's a viable question, uh, Rich. But end of the day, you can't change the rules year by year based on who's hot, who's not popularity. The rules are the rules. So that's 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 why you have the seedings, and you know we expanded the wild cards. You know, the the wild card used to be a one game plan. Now it's best of three. You know, but then people bitching. Well, that means the first first two winners in the league sit out almost a whole week because you get. I mean, so then baseball came back and said, okay, the best of three will be in one location. We're not doing cross country trips. Mm-hmm. I think it's as good as it can get. It, I'll tell you, it's pretty electric though. When they went to the the one game. In essence, a play, wild card play in the whole damn world stopped. Got to watch this game because it's win or die. Yeah. And so, and of course, today for the Atlanta Braves, they lost. They died in the first game when they had it right in their hand. I, heartbreak is unbelievable. Yeah, I need to check the score on what's going on there. But I, I just remember when I was a kid in the early 70s, that was when divisional play first started. Mm-hmm. And the AL NL Championship Series, I think, were best of five. And then they went to the World Series. But sometimes I get confused because the first round's best of three. Is the divisional round best of five? Then the championship is seven and the World Series is seven. Yeah. And it was weird because I've seen a few more curveballs in life than you have. <laughs> um, although I don't foul them off. I usually punch it the other way. It goes yeah, for a base of course. hit. Yeah. But it, at the end of the day, the World Series used to, you know, it was American League, National League. And I, I grew up back when there were eight teams in each league. And the World Series was just... I remember the Yankees and the Braves, the Yankees and the Dodgers, and all that. And then interleague play came along, and I thought, well, that's kind of novel. We'll get to see it. And the first couple of years of interleague play, John, they took the schedule and they packed it around the All-Star game. And that's when interleague play began. It starts June 1st, everybody play everybody else, come out of the All-Star game, everybody play everybody else, and then we'd roll into July, and we'll go back to playing. I wish they'd do that now. I, we've lost a little bit of the zing by having interleague games the first week of the season or, you know, the fifth week of August, etc. I'd like – I'm all big in marketing. This is really damn important, so watch it. That's why the NFL is so successful. Oh, Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday. Yeah, um, it, it – I just want to go back here first of all, the seeding. Doesn't the NBA reseed? One of the leagues does, doesn't they? No, not anymore. NBA, NBA came up with their old gimmick and gadget. You know, you're the only guy I know that bought season tickets for play in games. Hmm. Doesn't say much about you <laughs> intellectually. But God, I shouldn't have drank so much coffee today. I wouldn't be on the edge as much as I am. <laughs> but no, they, they, there's been a lot of talk about reseed, but they, I don't think they want to tamper with the integrity. The playoffs are the playoffs. NHL's talked about reseed, you know, but no. But it was cool back then and back in the day before interleague because I grew up a National League fan and the American League was like on another planet. Yeah. You know, and it was it was like a like a te- when it, when Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley come together. It's like a crossover when you can play a team in the American League. It was like you were it was sacrilegious or something, you know, and it's it's kind of neat. To quote Henry Winkler. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. OK, let's go to Carlos. Chargers are done. They probably get beat by high school teams. Yeah, I won't go that far, but this is a bad, bad piece of luck. I mean, to lose your left tackle and right tackle, both significant injuries. I was told maybe four weeks for Slater and Alt. That's that's really hard because those are the bookends, and you know, you can you can run all these other big guys out there, but those guys are backups, and there's reasons they are backups because they're not equal, and and to compound it, 
their center situation, they got Brad Bozeman, a journeyman center from Carolina. He is like 29th rated offensive center in the league five weeks into the season. So his, his ratings in terms of blocking and all that isn't that good. So the Chargers have really got O-line problems. And despite the courage and the heroics and the moxie of Justin Herbert, he's taken a lot of hits. There are statistics for offensive linemen? Oh, yes. There's I, all types of rating. I, I never heard of that. Well, if you wouldn't go to bed at 930 <laughs> at night, you'd have time on the computer to go search this now, junk out. Now, that takes some serious film work to break down that data. Oh, I mean, well, because they're not doing it in real time, are they? No yeah, way. No, no. But they, I mean, there are groups that that's what they do. I think there's a there's one collection that does all statistics. I think it's called Fans Focus. Uh, you have to subscribe to it and all that. So, yeah, but there's all types of rating systems for virtually anything, including how good the offensive linemen are. You rank guard to guard, tackle to tackle, offensive center, etc. I remember like about five, six years ago, there was a kid that lived around the corner from me that was the third highest ranked long snapper in the United States for high school. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how in the hell do you rank that? Well, accuracy, Mm -hmm. power of getting the snap back. How quick does the snap get back there? The consistency of the spiral. Man, that is a rabbit hole right there. That's of data. right. You can go down that <laughs> hole and get lost for a week. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, comment. Next question. Okay, let's go here to Carlos. You think the Padres are going to get through the first round? I think so. At home? Yeah. But even on the road, they got the second best road record in baseball. And, you know, if they had been forced to go on the road, no problem. That's easy for me to say. They don't have to go to Dodger. I don't have to go to Dodger Stadium the second series or to go to Philadelphia the second series. But this thing is loaded. And, you know, there have been people I've seen on social media, people just bagging on me. Oh, you're the one that said Preller is in jeopardy, lose his job. You were the <laughs> asshole that used the comment House of Cards. Well, yeah, that's when you were screaming like I was screaming about them being underachievers through June 15th and losing I heard you screaming about losing to Miami and losing to the Rockies and losing to the Pirates. And and now you're bagging on me because I was presenting the information that was available at that time. Now, the information now is a little bit different. Social media. Boy, just. Well, see, they it. think they try to uh, figure out if you're a fan of the team. I'm just covering the team. Right. You're a sports journalist. You know, you cover the team. You have your take, your, your one man's opinion. But I think, you know, as a fan of the team, you don't like people jumping on the bandwagon, jumping off the bandwagon. And I think they're projecting that on you. Full disclosure, I went to Catholic elementary school. So I had a great education, arithmetic and geography and all that, and religion, catechism and all that. Didn't have any background in music. Yeah, never had artwork, never had music, which was really kind of weird, kind of felt degraded. I never learned to sing Kumbaya. So that's why I feel the way I feel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In terms cool. of covering the job, the team. Kumbaya. All right, let's go to Gary. And Gary's got a long one here talking Chargers. Dean Spanos has had uh, how long to build a fan base in Los Angeles? Getting close to six to seven years now. There is more red at SoFi than an Alabama home game. His dream was to be successful in Los Angeles. What is success, Dean? Almost one fifth of the way to another half century of failure for Los Angeles. I remember watching the San Diego Chargers looking up in the stands and saw all the Raider fans in the stands after a big loss and would just shake their heads. David Bin especially (laughs) must be so demoralizing. Well, I'm not going to pile on. But what you said was damn true. Uh, Let's be honest. This is the 37th season. The first family of football's on that team. First family of football's had 16 winning seasons in 37 years. And those are the people that fired a Hall of Fame coach in Don Goriel, a Super Bowl coach in Bobby Beathard, a 200-win coach in Marty Schottenheimer, and a Hall of Fame general manager in Bobby Beathard. Those are the facts as presented today. Yeah, and them's the facts, <laughs> you know. And, and yeah, I mean, this the ownership there is just unbelievable. But it's weird. We were just talking about long snappers. This guy brings up David Bin, I mean, one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Eighteen years worth of doing something we none of us understand, but he was really good at it. Yeah, who? <laughs> what a coincidence, right there. Okay, Cal let's, Golden Bear. Okay, let's let's go here down the list. And uh, oh, David Ramos has been poking you with this one. Otani, 6 for 11, arise 0 for 12 in the Dodgers versus Padres series. Who's ready for the playoffs? They're both really good players, but Otani has just been fierce. Uh, I'm trying to remember the statistic as of last Friday. Otani was 
I I can't recall. He was the player of the week, but the, he was hitting like five ninety five for the, that final week in the middle of the pennant race. He's just just so gifted and a rise. He's I'm not going to say an acquired taste because you have to respect the accomplishment. You win three batting titles in a row. Dude is doing a lot of things. I have never seen a modern day ball player swing at so much stuff outside the strike zone and yet put it in play and get a base hit. You yeah. know, I I, I, jo- I joked with John. I said. Do you know there's three area codes in San Diego where we live? <laughs> 760, 619, and 858. And a rise comes to the plate, and he'll get pitches in all those area codes, and he'll swing at all of them. He's the best bad ball hitter in baseball modern day I've seen. I thought Yogi Berra was the all-time greatest bad ball hitter. This dude hits balls off his shoelaces and drives it. I mean, he's just he's really unique. And 314... That's pretty damn impressive, considering he's had some spells where he kind of went into a funk, yet he's hitting 314. I just like his personality. He's oh, yeah. like a fun guy. He's like out there, and he's excited to be here for a winning team because he was he was playing for the Marlins that weren't going anywhere. So, yeah, this, it's it's a pleasure to have him. But, you know, when I think of bad ball hitters, I think of Vladimir Guerrero Sr. Oh, wild swinger. Yeah, and he would be all over the place, and that dude would drive the ball. But Arias is just kind of like a— like a unicorn. He's like this unusual thing we haven't seen. It's not exactly Tony Gwynn, probably like more like Rod Carew. Yeah, he acts in a batter's box like he drank too much coffee, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he just, he's amazing. And here's here's the closing aspect of that conversation. <laughs> AJ Preller got him from Miami and got Miami to pay his whole salary this year. Executive of the year, man. That's him, AJ That's Preller. Amazing. Now, Next yeah. year, they're going to have to pay $10 million to keep them. But I think Hosmer comes off the payroll, yeah, doesn't he? exactly. So they'll be able to move some things around. Okay, next question. Okay, let's uh, – actually, John had an NBA comment. He says, when the NBA auctioned the Clippers to Steve Ballmer for $2 billion, Dean's eyes rolled like slot machines. His idea was to move the team and score a payday. His family is in construction and can't build anything more than slum apartments and strip malls. Well, you can denigrate them if you want. I'll sign that memo. Um, At the end of the day, uh, you know, they've had one Super Bowl team and have hardly had any playoff teams. And like I say, 16 winning seasons in year 37. They're not the Roonies. They're not the Maras. They're not the first family of football, the Crafts. So that's where we are. But do like the quarterback. You know, and stupid me said, I hope Justin (laughs) Herbert goes 17 and 0. And I hope Dean Spanos goes 0 and 17. I have a right to say what I want my old podcast, and that's what I feel. Well, you know, you said earlier, like, organizations. Win or lose. Yeah. And so that's why you see the consistency of failure here. I mean, it goes right to the top of the hierarchy chart. But you can you can go through bad cycles. As great as Bob Kraft was in New England, they're in the midst of a bad cycle right now. Post Bill Belichick, it's going to take them some time. That happens to lots of places. But... Great organizations work their way through it and get out of it. I, I'm such a huge believer in the way the Roonies do their business in Pittsburgh. Their standard of drafting, developing, and coaching. Hell, they've had three coaches since 1968. Chuck Knoll. Think about that. That that's that's nuts. I mean, yeah. I, that doesn't exist anywhere. I mean, we're talking about all the managers that have been cycling through, like the uh, Anaheim Angels, and and to have three coaches since 1968. Since 68. Chuck Knoll, Bill Cower, Mike Tomlin. And Bill Cower still going strong on TV. Yeah, telling you what he thinks. Yeah, Tomlin, I think, is all right. I think he's he's, he's good. Okay, you want to get some uh, yeah, social media? social media here. Okay, let's go there and scroll down the list. And uh, okay, let's uh, let's go here. Talking uh, Padres, whose staff is better? You brought it up. And Frank Dad says, don't jinx us, Hack. Oh, I'm not allowed to have an opinion on my podcast, but you're allowed to have an opinion <laughs> on my opinion on my podcast. Come on, Frank, please t- take out a chat- like, checklist. Just go ahead and compare. Who's got a better pitching staff? Padres over Dodgers. Padres probably a little bit over Philadelphia. Padres definitely better than the New York Yankees, top to bottom. And the Padres batting order is pretty good. And the Padres bench bunch is pretty good. When you say don't jinx them, I'm just giving you the facts. <laughs> I I love the superstition in sports. I mean, to this day, I'll make sure I wear a certain Padres shirt on a certain game. You know, and, and and I'll do that in other sports too. You know, and I know it's weird. It's just silly. 
But, you know, it, it, it makes you think you're somehow involved in the win or the loss. There's nothing wrong with being a fan. No, not all at the all. Time. Sean Lewis gave me crap today at the Aztec press conference. Oilers, hockey? I said, hey, it was clean. I put it on. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, he's a football coach. He doesn't know much about that. Okay, let's go here to talk a little Lakers with ASAP Mimic. He says, no Lakers fan who is invested into this team and following the team's every move through the, through the fan-made channels or even thinking about Bronny right now. The rest of the NBA community do not understand just how bad of a coach Darvin Ham was and certainly cost the Lakers a couple of wins with his terrible coaching all around. From play calling to lineups to development to crunch time decisions to preparations, Darvin is just a mediocre coach. Look for the Lakers to finish fourth through sixth in the West. Seventh through eighth is a worst case scenario well that that's optimistic we have to see if jj reddick's x's and o's work in the nba not having been a coach we see if he becomes the head coach or whether lebron james and anthony davis are coaches on the floor big issue <clears throat> you know Bronny james that's wasted conversation well i mean why would we be concerned about the 15th guy under contract and what he's going to contribute to a team that's got to get to the playoffs that's a little far-fetched to me. The bigger bigger storyline is Dalton Connect really the deal. If if he can hit threes, and he did in the summer league once he got his feet underneath him, he played really well in the NBA summer league. If Connect is the real deal, now suddenly that team looks very different. Uh, you know they're gonna they're gonna run the ball. They're gonna push the tempo. They are gonna shoot a lot more threes. That should help Austin Reeves. Um, can D'Angelo Russell be? Mr. Consistency, or will he continue to be hot and cold? And, you know, I, I quoted the statistic of Rui Hachimura. Even though he's not a stud as it relates to him, a star, they were 21-8 and eight when he was a starting power forward. So if, if they can find a mix for Rui to be part of and he's consistent and connect to hit, and they can push the tempo and hit threes, then it's just not on AD and King James to carry the thing. So as a lot of questions there have to be answered going forward when they open their camp in the next week. You know, whenever you're wondering about L.A. coaches, you have to think about LeBron. You know, at least like LeBron really the coach. Mm -hmm. You know, and it makes you wonder if there were differences of opinion in the locker room when they're drawing up game plans between Ham and LeBron and then potentially with J.J. Redick and LeBron, even though those two guys are buddies. So I don't know what to expect from J.J. Redick. It has to come from the players, though, on the floor. they got to respect the coach. Coach has to know what he's doing, but it's got to come from the players have to execute. And that means players four through 10 have to be able to contribute and be consistent and hopefully not get hurt, which has been part of the, the Lakers' problems, too. So fascinating list of questions to talk about going, and we're going to talk more about it as we roll into the month of October. Okay, we've got to talk about Dave Roberts, okay? Do you have time for that? Go ahead. Okay, let's get Dave Roberts' commentary, because there is so much talk on social media about this. And uh, um, let, 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 let's go here. The big question is, who's going to be the better manager in the playoffs? Roberts has been horrible in the postseason. Padres may have the edge. Oh, I think they do. I mean, we got all these 90 wins for Mike Schilt in St. Louis and now in San Diego without the star-studded superstar talent that the Dodgers have. Dave, Dave obviously has been critiqued, and rightfully so, although maybe it's not all his decision about who pitches, who doesn't pitches, who's first out of the bullpen, what matchup must we have. We're talking about postseason playoffs because that's where they're falling short. You know, and you go back and look at the use the usage of Urias in the bullpen coming out of the rotation or asking Kershaw to throw out of the bullpen, or obviously before that, the multiple times they overused Joe Kelly. Those all came from the manager, but did they come from upstairs on the analytics sheet that they sent down that said, we recommend this, this, this? I don't have the direct answer to that. But yeah, I also tend to think the Dodgers, and John and I talked about this last Friday, I think they're a little bit passive. You know, you don't see a hell of a lot of bunts. You don't see a lot of hit and runs with the Dodgers. It's like, well, we'll just hang around, get to the top of the batting order, and they'll put it in the seats. You know, the Padres are kind of built differently. The Padres play a lot of station-to-station, base-to-base baseball. I mean, they, they do squeeze bunts. They do dump the ball down the line. They try to move runners over and even do surprise stuff. You don't see a lot of that surprise stuff with the Dodgers. To me, the Dodgers are a little bit too passive, even though they got superstars at the top of the batting order. 
Well, there was another comment here about bunting, talking about the Dodgers, and that was from Eric. And he said, you know, I, I'm going to give him a pass for the World Series. The Astros cheated on. Number one, David Roberts has won and won a lot with one of the highest paid rosters in MLB history. I blame Dave Roberts for the monumental pitching collapses in a few playoff games, including the World Series. He just recently made an error against the Padres. Instead of bunting to bring Otani to the plate, he let Miguel Rojas hit into a triple play to end the game. It's errors of that nature that make me dislike him. The list goes on and on. Of course, the response from Dave Roberts was, if we lay the bunt down with Machado and the first baseman storming in, that could turn into a double play anyhow. Because it also could turn into, depending on where the ball is placed on the bunt, it could also be a throw into center field that they screw the play up. Hmm. So it's it's a real tough call. But Rojas is hitting around 300. Rojas putting bat on ball. Rojas drove that thing at Machado. That could have swallowed Machado up and gone into left field. So it's it's always hindsight is always twenty twenty in the rearview mirror. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to have Otani up. But even if it had been one out... You know, if Manny had only gotten one out, Otani would have come up, you know, still with guys who could score and face in Suarez. This turned into a triple play. You don't hardly see triple plays ever. I've never seen triple play ever in person or on TV. Yeah, it's very. I usually you see it a highlight, you know, when it, when it happens. Watching that one, and then I said I saw one where the Padres bunted into a triple play against the Dodgers. It was awful. Um, you know, it, it makes you wonder, too, like how much— how much um, impact does a manager have on a baseball roster? Like how many wins or losses could you directly point your finger at to say that's on the manager? John's got to come from the players. The players have to produce. I mean, here in that game today, that first game of the Atlanta must-win doubleheader with the Mets, they stayed with that starting pitcher into the eighth inning, and then he ran out of gas. He had an 11-pitch at bat that wound up being a double. That opened the floodgates. But it came from the pitchers. Atlanta went to the bullpen, and Joe Jimenez has been reliable. He got killed. And then they went to the closer, Iglesias, to try to stop the bleeding, and he got killed. It comes from the players. It can, you know, if if I've got an ace that's been pretty trustworthy for a long time, I'm going to keep going to him in the most crunch time situations that exist. So you can do X's and O's to a degree, but it's got to come from the players. Players have to produce. Yeah, you know, when you're managing a game and you're in it, you can feel energy. You know, that of, of how a pitcher or a hitter is going, you might say it's momentum, but the confidence level, you can see that. And some, you know, computer nerd in the front office that's delivering all the data downstairs, they don't see that. They don't understand that. So I wonder if, if Dave Roberts, is, is he just toeing the line to be a good company man? Or I wonder how often he maybe pushes back on the front office. He's pretty even keeled emotionally. I mean, I like him a great deal. I respect him a great deal as a person, much less a really good player and the highest winning manager in Dodger history. Yeah. L.A. Dodger history, Brooklyn Dodger history. Just, just think about that. But at the end of the day, the players have to produce. And for them to be where they are, first place, home field advantage, entire National League players, for them to be there with all the pitchers they lost, we... We flashed a board up here last Friday. I don't, I don't think the average fan understands the number of pitchers on the DL who had surgeries this year. I mean, it's phenomenal. 38 pitchers have used. 19 different starting pitchers have had to use. Seven season-ending surgeries. And that doesn't include Glass now and the other guys who are just gone because they've not been able to stay healthy, not having surgery, but aren't, aren't pitching right now. For them to be in first place with that Set of statistics, that's pretty impressive. And I also think there's an intangible. Dave Roberts, and i am not been in that clubhouse. I don't, you know, if there was our team here, I'd probably have a much better feel for it. His ability to control the egos and the emotions of that team, because they're all making unbelievable salaries, and there is no ego. They just, that is a consummate, collective 26-man roster. That plays really well together and obviously pulls the rope the same direction. There's not a lot of junk going on like the junk we had here in San Diego last year with the toxic Padre clubhouse. And Dave Roberts, he controls that out of respect. He's a good guy. Yeah, you, I think you know? so. Like when I see him interviewed on television, I'm like, right on. I I, I, I understand him. He's a man of good character. Um, 
But, you know, the fans, man, there, there are some fans that think that he has been given so much money, such top talent, that you could roll any manager out there and he would have won two or three World Series. Yeah, but it, he's victimized by the stupidity of Trevor Bauer, by the stupidity of Julio Urias. I mean, by the cloud of bad luck with Tyler Glass now's elbow injury again and again and again. That's all beyond his control. And yet... They're in first place and home field advantage for everything going to the World Series. And yeah, I mean, it's hard to see. I mean, we talk about Schilt as manager of the year. Roberts has got a damn good case. Yep. No, I'd give it to Schilt. What, what's his crew? He, what he had to create and fix compared to what Dave inherits and operates with. A little bit different. But hey, listen, we hope you have enjoyed this extended Monday bonus podcast. Playoffs, baby. Hmm. Baseball in October, it's really cool. We're going to be back here on Thursday at 1 p.m. Keep trying. We'll try to get to you further uh, next Thursday in our fans forum. This podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers, nine locations to serve you in San Diego. Dixie Line, your best friend. John, take a deep breath. We got baseball. Then we got Thursday night football. Then another weekend in the NFL, another weekend of college football. This is going to be fun. It's going to be great. Right now, we got Braves up one nothing in the bottom of the fourth in game two. Thank you for being with us. Always enjoy having you. Whether you agree or disagree, doesn't matter. We think we're giving you something really different, <laughs> as we say, sports talk radio, the way it should be done. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Have yourself a great day from Hacksaw's Headlines. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.